That doesn't fool you with the seatbelt on there still. My 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 background is my daughter's uh, TP ten. <laughs> there you go. Okay, go then. All right. Uh, good evening, viewers of Sports for All. Tonight, my guest, our guest, me and Brian, our guest is. We are um, in the presence of Indiana basketball greatness. Uh, with us is the president of the Basketball League, Coach David Magley. Coach, how are you this morning? You know what, I'm fantastic. It's a beautiful sunny day here in, in, in Indiana and I'm um, driving up to my brother's gym, which is, which is a ministry uh, back home in South Bend where I'm from. He has about 300 kids waiting that he feeds every Saturday a hot meal. He has a barber shop. He has all these things inside of his gym. And I get a chance to share with him today, which is something that's a lot of fun for me to come encourage some young people. Coach, how's the COVID situation in Indiana? Um, most, of, most of the people in Indiana don't acknowledge it. So you go to a high school. I was at a high school basketball game last night with, you know, a couple thousand fans. There were probably eight masks in the gym. You know, they don't, you know, I, I think a lot, most of the people are vaccinated, um, but they're just, you know, it's really been like this for the last year, year and a half, where once we got through the first few months of COVID and they started opening up, people in Indiana, they just don't really acknowledge it. Whereas New York or, or California, my goodness, you would think that we're in a pandemic that if you get it, everyone's going to die. So they react much more strict. Coach, um, I, I read in your bio you attended a, a LaSalle school in high school. Um, me and Brian attended a uh, LaSalle school in, in college for, for, for university. Really? In, in, in the Philippines? Yes, yes. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of LaSalle schools here in the Philippines. Brian and I attended the LaSalle University. And I read in your bio you attended South Bend LaSalle High School. Yeah. Well, well here he was an explorer, uh, Robert D. LaSalle. D did he go to the Philippines? Well, there were LaSalle brothers. The, the LaSalle school here, the LaSalle schools here were set up by LaSalle brothers. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian. Um, and the, the brothers, I'm sure, will correct me if I'm wrong. There were Irish, I think, Irish brothers from LaSalle who established the school here. So here in the Philippines, we're known as Green Archers. Yeah. Okay. Huh. How about that? Yep. So you know, Brian and I are talking to a fellow Lasallian. Yeah, there you go. We were we were Lasall Lions when I when, when I went to high school. All right, coach. Do you still follow KU basketball? A little bit, not as much as you would think. I mean, Bill Self is is uh, in my opinion, um, if not the best coach in college basketball, one of the top two or three, and. He's won that conference 14 out of 15 years or 15 out of 16 years, won a national championship, and he's made us all really proud to be Jayhawks. Um, I think that uh, I'm so busy that I, I, I don't I only watch basketball on TV when there's something that really piques my interest. Like, like I'll watch the Bulls play because I like the style of play they're playing. I'll watch Clay Thompson come back because I love the fact that he's worked so hard to get back. I'll watch um, the Phoenix Suns because Monty Williams is from my brother's ministry and he's just a great guy. And so we're, we're big Monty Williams fans. Um, so I mean, that's, that's what drives, you know, our motivations is, is, is that kind of stuff. And coach, I want to ask you, how's, uh, how's Bobby Knight these days? Uh, you know, I don't know Coach Knight very well. You know, I, mean, I played against him, and, and he recruited me just a little bit. Uh, but I am good friends with a guy named Kent Benson, who was one of his best players ever on starting center on an undefeated national championship team, number one draft pick in the NBA with the Milwaukee Bucks. 
and he says that that Coach Knight's in a you know he's he's uh, you know he's he's in a tough place. He's he's uh, he's he's not as as the same as he was uh, mentally anymore. That he's probably got a little touch of dementia, and it's 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 kind of tough. And you know, it's good that he's come back home to Indiana, where he was so loved, and you know he gets to spend his last days in an environment that's, so, that's surrounded by so many players and fans that, that he really loved because he left uh, to go to Texas under some bad, bad uh, covering. And, and I think just really um, deserves, because he did, he really did a wonderful job at IU to, to be celebrated some as his days, you know, get numbered. Coach, I want to ask you, if, if you follow Hoosier, uh, Indiana University, Hoosier basketball, they have not, how should I say this? They have not been prominent in the postseason, in the college postseason in a while. What is not working for their program? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, when, 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 um, when Johnny Wooden first retired from, from UCLA, uh, uh, it, 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 it took them um, 15, 20 years to really start recapturing some of that magic because he was just a legend. And when, and when Coach Knight left, you know, they replaced him with some guys that I think weren't bad, but I think that they probably needed more time. Uh, it's not as easy. Not that it was ever easy, but, you know, Coach Knight was an innovator that, that he brought in the motion offense that no one had ever seen. His teams really got after the, the, the defensive side of the ball really good. And quite frankly, he recruited the great state of Indiana better than anybody. So, you know, his national championship teams typically had 11 out of 12 guys or 13 out of 14 guys would be from Indiana. And, you know, as he was waning, Purdue was getting really good. Notre Dame was getting really good. Butler got really good. Uh, Indiana State got good. Ball State got good. Valparaiso got good. Evansville's good. There's a lot of Division I schools in Indiana that you got to recruit against. So, you know, if you can't dominate your state recruiting, it's going to be hard to dominate the country because that's a very good conference, the Big Ten. So, you know, I think it's been difficult for them. I think the guy they've got now, Mike Woodson, is going to do a really nice job. He's a Indiana guy, a Indiana high school legend, college legend, good NBA player, a nice NBA coach. I think that he's going to get it done if they're patient. It may take him a few years, but I think he'll be really good. My last question, before I turn you over to Brian, what was the idea, coach? What was your idea behind or rationale be, behind establishing the, the basketball league? Well, it actually... Um, is uh is, is is my wife's vision um i am um you know, i played and, and all that stuff and then and then i was coaching high school and then um i got a chance to coach pro in canada and uh the nbl canada is a really good league and uh, i was coaching at a good level and we had some good success and and then, you know, the opportunity came up. They need a little bit of direction, so they hired me as their commissioner. And I was there two years, and, and we had really nice success in that role. But my second year in, in Canada as the commissioner, my fourth year overall, I spent 340 nights in a Marriott property. And that's a long time to be away from your wife and kids and, and grandkids. And, and um, my wife is smoking hot. For me to be away from her, uh, a week doesn't make sense, let alone a whole year. So I got to the point that I needed to be home with my best friend and my my kids and all that stuff. So, and, and be a grandpa, let the grandkids know who I am. So I came back and I started a different league with a different person. Uh, it was called the NAPB. We had a nice first year and it just didn't, uh, the relationship with him didn't work quite as well as I would have liked. And, and we were going to have to make some tough decisions. And one night, you know, after I came back from a discussion with him, my wife got really emotional and was in, in, the, in the restroom, you know, just crying and praying. And she believed God told her, why don't you start your own league and hire David? And it would be a different league. It'd be a league 
where we would be all about the kids and we make certain that they get paid and we make certain that they get great jobs and we make certain that they use their local celebrity to impact impact the community. You know, it's you're a big deal. And, and if you're a PBA player in the Philippines, I got to imagine a lot of people know who you are. Well, you kind of have an obligation then to use that the right way. And it's the same as the TBL player here, not the same, because I know the PBA is, is the pro league there. And we're just, you know, we're the third level behind the NBA and the G League. But still, in most of our towns, we're a big deal. So, you know, with that vision, she came in and, and woke me up and we got to work it. And now we've grown from eight teams the first year to 10 the second, 12 the third. <clears throat> when COVID hit, we had to shut down three days before the NBA. And our option is, what do you go? How do you go forward with COVID? Well, we doubled. We doubled down. We went to 29 teams and had 2019 start and 2019 finish. And now we're sitting at 43. So, you know, the, the value of that many teams allows our league to have rivalries that are within driving distance, uh, allows our teams to save and travel expense because they don't have to fly. You can play in a conference most of your games. So there's very little airfare, very few hotels. So the cost factors come in so teams can make money. And, you know, and 190 guys of our, of our players are playing in, around the world right now. And 12 are in the G League and a couple in the NBA. So, you know, the, the, the vision that my and thousands of young people are having their lives touched by our guys. So my wife's vision has been exactly the game plan that we've, that we've operated under, and we've had some good success. All right, Brian. Oh, um, I've only heard about, I'll be honest, I'll be, I've only heard about the basketball league just now. But when I look at it, wow, it's really a big league. It's a good league, Brian. Mm -hmm. we, we are, so you've got the NBA, you've got the G League. We would be like Pro B. Mm -hmm. We would, if there's a second division behind the PBA, we would be that mm -hmm. because it probably pays more and they're, they're the league in the country. But if we were in Europe, we would be Pro B. If we were in, in Asia, we would be Pro B. But here, because they use the term minor, we're considered a minor league, but we're really not. We're pro because every player gets paid. We play in good venues, we have good uniform deals, we have good live streaming. 145 countries watch our live streaming every year. And we're, and we're having an impact. Mm -hmm. well, Coach, you mentioned it earlier there were some NBA players who came from there. Yes. Uh, this I ask year, you? Uh, well, this year, Craig Sward got picked up with the, with the Washington uh, Wizards. Mm -hmm. And then Xavier Moon mm -hmm. uh, got oh, yeah. picked up uh, with, with uh, the LA Clippers. And he just re-signed his third 10-day uh, uh, mm -hmm. yesterday. And again... Uh, Craig was in our league just last year. X was in our league the first year. But, you know, if, if you've touched our league, we're going to claim your success because mm -hmm. we're, you know, we were a part of it. We're not the only part of it, but mm -hmm. we absolutely helped. You know, Xavier went from our league to, to be do really well in Canada. We worked because of my connections in Canada to get in place, in the right place. And then he's really dominated the leagues up there since he went up there. And, you know, he did, he did good in our league. He was the, the rookie of the year. It's, is, is fresh out of college with us. How about, um, I mean, you're very familiar with the, Filip with the Filipinos. Are there any Filipinos or Americans or whatever they're playing well, or who have played there? In, in the you know, I don't, I, I, I don't know that because um, it's like, it's like uh, we have one team last year had three Native Americans and we didn't know that until we got there. You know, Chance Comanche, a seven footer from Arizona that's, Really good, Lindy Waters that played it, played at uh, uh, Oklahoma State, and, and and Wayne Reynolds that played it, um, played at Creighton. Um, so, so you know, I don't really know all of the all of their backgrounds like that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, there's a lot of mixed kids with a Filipino descent. So there there could be. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, Coach, I want to dig into your your past. Uh, I've been reading a lot of. I saw that you were with the Cleveland Cavaliers in 1982. At that yes, time, I was. Well, at that time, I was already following the NBA. Not Well, in the Philippines at that time, we couldn't watch the NBA game like how we do now. But I'm pretty familiar with, the, with the, the, some of the names. Um, Coach, can, 
for the benefit of the viewers who were who were not aware of how the NBA was during that time, can you give us a brief background on how the league was run then? Well, you know, there's 30 NBA teams now. Mm-hmm. When I played, there was 23. Mm-hmm. When I played, you were only allowed to keep 12 guys. Now they're allowed to keep 15. Uh, there, there really wasn't a connected G League like there is. There was a CBA, which was the minor league affiliate back then. Um, uh, we did not have major television uh, contracts. You know, the, 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 the NBA finals were tape delayed. They weren't even broadcast live. Cable television was just coming into its own. Um, there were, uh, you know, there were racial stereotypes in our country. Uh, there was a belief that black people weren't smart enough to be quarterbacks. And then Doug Williams became a quarterback of the Washington Redskins and led them to a Super Bowl championship. And all of a sudden they're going, ah, maybe they are smart enough. And next thing you know, you've got the Patrick Mahomes and the Michael Vicks and there's a lot of wonderful black quarterbacks to prove that wasn't true. Uh, they also believe that white people couldn't play certain athletic positions because I'm a six foot eight guard, but that didn't exist. That was, they'd never seen a six foot eight white guard because they didn't think we were quite athletic enough. Um, which the way that got proven wrong is the Europeans came into the NBA. Sarunas Marcelonis and Detlef Shrimp and Dirk and Tony Kukoc and all these guys that are playing out away from the basket at 6'7", 6'9", 6'10", 7 foot. Well, I, they have the same DNA I do. Why are they athletic enough and I'm not? Well, they just never seen it before. So when you, when you break the stereotype, but I played just before then. So it was a, my style of play was probably more conducive to like the way Luca would play today. That's what I was. I was a 6'8 guard, but they kept wanting me to put weight on and play under the basket, which just wasn't the way I, I was my skill set. So. Yeah, you know, it, it it was it was, listen, it's a dream come true to get to play one game in the NBA when you're from when you're from Indiana. The 15 largest high school gyms in the world are in the United States. 14 of them are in are in Indiana. So to give you a feel how big high school basketball is in Indiana, I don't think I ever played before less than two or three thousand fans every game I played in high school. So get the a chance to play in the NBA was just way beyond anything I ever dreamed I could do. Coach, at that time, um, it, this was the time that the Philadelphia 76ers won the title, right? Am I correct? This was, was yeah, they were they, they won the championship that year with Dr. J and and um, Moses and Malone, Bobby Jones and Moses Malone and, and Doug Collins and 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 yeah, they they were they were really pretty good back then. So aside from them and the Lakers with Magic Johnson, were there other teams that were re- really very good at that time? Oh well, yeah, I mean the Boston Celtics with Larry Bird and mm-hmm. Kevin McHale and. You know, I mean, it, it's, 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 uh, Michael hadn't gotten to Chicago yet. I played against Michael his first game as a freshman at Carolina. He would come a couple of years after I left. But, you know, there was, there was three or four really good teams. Portland was always dangerous. De- uh, uh, Denver was always dangerous. You know, there was some, there were some other good teams that were right there as well. Coach, you just mentioned it. I want to ask, how was it playing against uh, MJ in his uh, freshman year? Well, it's, it's, you know, he was, he was good. James Worthy was really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sam Perkins was very good. And you know, Michaels obviously went on to be the best player ever to play the game. Um, but he was a freshman in college and I'm a senior in college. So to me, he's just a young freshman. I don't have any respect for him. Uh, mm-hmm. I had 24 points. He had 12, but he's not wearing ground Magley. I'm wearing Air Jordan. So he did a little better than I did. That's for sure. Are there any memorable plays or interactions you had with him? Do you remember um, any? No, I mean, I remember, I, I remember stealing a ball from him once, and I remember uh, him jumping really high on his jump shot. Mm-hmm. But again, Worthy was so doggone good. You had to be aware of him all the time. I mean, James Worthy was 6'9". His hands were incredibly big. He could just, you could throw him the ball and he could just catch it. He didn't need a I mean, he and Michael both have really big hands, but the, the team was built around James. James was the number one draft pick. So, you know, I remember them saying that they thought Jordan was, you know, the next David Thompson, mm-hmm. who was an incredible player from North Carolina State. And I thought, man, these people don't know what they're talking about. 
boy, were they right. I mean, he's he's a, he's a, he's absolutely the greatest player to ever play during cable television time. I don't know if I'd say he's the best player ever, just because I don't think if if we just saw all of Wilt Chamberlain's highlights in yeah. slow motion on ESPN, we might rethink that because people forget that Wilt Chamberlain, Wilt has almost a hundred records in the NBA and he's been dead 25 years. So, you know, it, it's, it's been, it's been, people don't realize how dominant it was. And you could argue both sides and say, well, the league was watered down. Well, was it, you know, when Wilt came in the league, there were only eight teams. Yeah. So all the best players played and they all played, when he first got there, they all played east of the Mississippi. Mm-hmm. So you didn't fly around first class, stay in luxury motels. You got on trains and buses and drove all night and played, and, 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 and it was tough. And so I can't say one's better than the other, but I think it's a little disingenuous. I mean, I watch people list the greatest Lakers of all times. They don't put Jerry West in there. They don't put Wilton there. They don't put Elgin Baylor in there. They sometimes don't even throw magic, mm-hmm. you know, because they – only the the LeBron and Kobe and mm-hmm. and Shaq and 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 those guys, they're all great players. But come on, I mean, there was some really wonderful guys, Kareem and some great players that were there before. That you got to give. And that Laker franchise has been fabulous for a long time. Well, you mentioned James Worthy. I don't correct me if I'm wrong, Coach. Was he overshadowed by the the hype surrounding Michael Jordan during their time? Because no. I know I know he's very good. I, I no, no. without a doubt, James Worthy is so good. Because remember, Michael was a freshman mm-hmm. when James Jr. and they won the national championship. And you know, Michael hit a big shot in the national championship game, but it was James's team. There was no, there was no doubt about it. People thought Michael was going to turn into a pretty good player, mm-hmm. but at that point, they did not know he was going to be the Michael Jordan. The old joke was. The only person that could hold Michael Jordan under 30 points was Dean Smith as coach at Carolina because he never scored like that at Carolina. But by the time I remember seeing Michael in one of his first exhibition games, I was friends with a guy named Orlando Woolridge mm. that was playing Chicago at the time. And they came to play in Des Moines, Iowa, where I was living. And I went to the game. And um, after the game, I mean, he was good, but it wasn't like he became. But I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to, to see, oh, and he comes out. and I'm like, what's, what's all the people waiting by the locker room? Because mm-hmm. you're not going to believe this, but this rookie, Jordan, is so popular. I'm like, what? So, I mean, he was gaining that popularity by the time he left Carolina. But it just took off. I remember seeing Phil. I was at the game. I had a teammate named Darnell Valentine mm-hmm. who was playing for Cleveland in the game when a Michael hits the last shot over yes. Craig Elo and the old a Gatorade commercial, like Mike, I want to be like Mike. Yeah. I was, I had gone up earlier that day to Cleveland to work Darnell out. We played some one-on-ones and I rebounded for him. And after the game, I was waiting for Darnell and I saw Phil Jackson who had coached me with, uh, in, in, in the CBA. And he took me in their locker room. And Phil was an assistant coach then. And it was, it was, you know, you could tell, the line of people waiting to talk to Michael was incredible. And then Phil got the head coaching job in Chicago and I was in O'Hare airport and they still flew commercial for the first couple of years after Phil got head coach. Then they flew private, but I saw Phil and he's Max, you know, he sat sitting here talking to him, sitting in the, in the airport talking to Phil. I'm like, where's Michael? Is he hurt? He said, no, Michael doesn't walk in the airport like everybody else. I said, what do you mean? He said, there's a series of tunnels underneath all these airports. And when Michael gets there, he's got to go under the airport because he can't get to the gate because he's so popular. If people see Michael Jordan, they're going to stop him. They're going to ask him for autographs. Mm-hmm. They're going to want pictures. So he goes under a tunnel and he, they just take him up outside, uh, put him on the plane, and either sit him in a window seat and make sure people sit by him, or they leave him in the bathroom. So everybody can get on, and then Michael would get on. And then before, when the plane would land, Michael was the first one off, so they could do the same thing to get through the airport. Because if not, you just can't get it done. It's just, it's just, he's just too popular. And you know, I mean, it's it's he's proven worthy. I mean, six out of six championships that he played in, his shoe line is the best that's ever been. Um, he's is 
has just done amazing things. You got to give them all the credit in the world. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, Coach, I'll save my question for later. But before I turn it over to Vince, I'd like to give a shout out to Alvin Magnay. He's a YouTuber who makes uh, NBA content. So he's watching us right now. All right. Fantastic. Vince, back to you. All right, Coach. You, you mentioned, and I read you were, you were involved with uh, NBL Canada. Yes. Okay. Um, were you around when there was a, an all-out brawl um, in one of the finals? I'm not sure if this was early 2010s or mid or, or early 2000s. There was a really big brawl between the two teams before the before games seven started. It was one of those best of seven championships in uh, NBL Canada. Um, were, you, were you part of the league then when that happened? Yes. Uh, I lost a 3-1 lead in the semis or else we would have been playing in that series. Uh, Windsor beat us. They came back from a 3-1 deficit to beat us 4-3. And, um, and that's, that's how I became the commissioner because of that brawl. Um, they didn't have a commissioner at the time. Uh, the series was chippy the whole time. And they were just, because no one was really the commissioner, no one was trying to rein it in. And it just escalated. And, um, and, and one thing happened. And um, they both showed up at the same time for a shoot around uh, earlier in the yes. day. And, you know, the ball rolled down by the coach. The coach picked it up. Uh, I mean, the, the, the other team picked it up, a big guy, and he was the, – the coach felt threatened. And the coach is a guy from Detroit, and he is not backing down from anybody. And he scooped the legs of the kid, and it just was on from there. And, and um, when it became – they broke it up finally. When the game time came, uh, they um, – they, the team from Halifax decided not to play in the finals. And, you know, they had 7,000 fans show up and there was no game. And they awarded a champion off of that, which just became a really black eye for the league. And they needed somebody strong to step in and try to kind of change the direction of the league because it was a wonderful league. It was it's such a cool league that that's such a dark mark that, you know, the first thing I did when they made me the commissioner was, I went to all the markets and had town hall meetings to say, all the fans come out, ask me any question you want, because whatever you're not happy about, I didn't do it. So I'm not offended by it. Let's see if we can fix this thing. And we were able to go from, at that time, there were eight teams. Uh, both those teams got in some trouble financially. One ended up shutting down and we had to bring back new ownership for them. Another team then got, uh, the market got purchased by the Raptors to become the Raptors 905 in Mississauga. So we had a lot of things to fix. Uh, we owned one of the teams in, in Moncton, New Brunswick at the time. And, you know, two years later, we were up to 11 teams with new ownership groups and three or four of those markets. And it was a better place. And, it, and I think I left it better than I got it. And, you know, I loved it. I mean, Canada is a great country and the fans were wonderful. Uh, the owners are good. The venues are excellent. The players were great. I mean, there's a lot to sell. There's a lot to market, a lot of, and had a lot to work with. It's just, we needed to be more transparent with our fans because we lost a lot of credibility on that event. Are you still, are you still in touch with the league? Are you? Well, yeah, ironically, uh, because of COVID, uh, Canada's responded really, really conservative and strict. And so half their league can't play. So in order to help them this year, we're partnering with them and we're actually playing 24 games against the NBL Canada to help them fill out their season. Um, they'll still have their own champion. We'll have our own champion, but it's just kind of a way to help them and work with them. And, you know, we're, uh, I'm, I'm really close with those guys and I pull for them and cause I love, them. I mean, I, I committed a big chunk of my life to that place. Uh, I would be, I would be unfortunate if I did anything but try to build up that league and help them any way I could. You played for Phil Jackson in, in the early 80s. And obviously with your story about, about the Chicago Bulls, about seeing him again, from that time you played for him till the time he, he was coaching the Lakers, did his character, 
character or personality somewhat shift or change from the time you played for him? No. I mean, I think he, we didn't do a triangle offense because he didn't know Tex Winters at the time. Gosh. But can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Coach. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, uh, yes, so yes. We, Loud and clear. We, um, he did not know they have the triangle offense at the time because uh, he hadn't met Tex Winters. But his philosophy of, of – um, uh, the way he treated guys, the substitution patterns. Again, we didn't have Michael or Kobe, so nobody played the whole game. But he 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 really got you to buy into the to the team, and 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 he was a great coach. I mean, you can't you can't argue uh, what his what his accomplishments and and we won the championship as well. So you know, I mean, it's it was a different style of play, and there was no MJ or Kobe, but Phil's a great coach, and that proves it. I want to get your thoughts on, on today's, you know, how, how they play the game, which is a lot of um, pace and space, Coach. Um, I want to get your thoughts on this. And, and if you were coaching an NBA team, is this, is this some, something you would subscribe to? Um, yeah, I mean, I like, like to me, the, 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 the greatest basketball stat in my lifetime is when Clay Thompson scored 61 points and dribbled less than 10 times. That, that's the way the game should be. You should move without the ball. You should be ready to catch and shoot. You should, you should work harder without the ball than with the ball. So I like the way Steve Kerr coaches. I like the way I love watching, um, I love watching the Suns play because I think Monty has those guys playing well. I'm, I'm not a big fan of watching. I remember one year, uh, Houston was up 3-1 on Golden State five, six years ago. And James Harden dribbled more in that one game than the entire starting lineup of the Golden State Warriors. That's a problem for me. I mean, you can't argue with James's success. He's the Bears is amazing. But I just don't think it's an appealing game to watch. Somebody that sits on the ball as long as he does it does not have the ball movement or the player movement that I think makes an appealing brand of basketball. For a basketball purist, I think that that's, that, that star power, the um, ability to do whatever I want has probably hurt the game some. I think, I think I couldn't imagine a player when I played just saying, I don't want to honor my contract. I don't want to play here anymore. I want to go someplace else. Because I don't understand if, if I determine you have a guaranteed contract and I don't want to pay you anymore as an owner, can I do that? No, you still got to pay him. So why can these kids say, I don't want to play in Cleveland, I want to go to Boston. I don't want to play in Boston, I want to go to the Nets. I don't, I don't understand why. I understood when, when your contract's done, you're a free agent, that's fair. But I'm not understanding where that happened. And then the other piece I struggle with is the, I think the NBA is trying to clean it up, but, but the, I don't like the flopping on the three pointers. I don't like uh, if you get the ball stolen and, 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 and you just turn around and reach and grab a kid and, and stop a fast break. I don't like yeah. that because, and I don't know when that happened. I don't even know how it's evolved to that, but it's just, it's, it's just, it's lazy. Uh, not only is it lazy, it's not fair to the fans who want to see these guys who jump higher than they've ever jumped. I mean, these kids, you, you see the block that John Morant had the other day was unbelievable. Well, to not allow him to go fly and get a dunk is unfair because you got the ball stolen. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, Coach, makes uh, a lot of sense. My next question is... Um, if, if, you know, you, you, you coach um, high school basketball, what, what, is your, what is your coaching style? What is your, um, what, what style of play do you implement? Are you more de defensive oriented? Are you, do you, do you, is it more freestyle for you? Well, I think, I think, so there's, there's uh, three or four very distinctive things that I do as a coach. Number one, 
is I will never treat a player any different than I treat my children. So I don't cuss kids. I don't raise my voice at kids. If I can't use my normal speech to motivate you, then you're the wrong person. I've got the wrong guy. It's not, I'm not going to change who I am because you need to be screamed at and cursed at. That's just not going to happen. Uh, number two, I don't believe in playing anybody more than six to eight minutes at a time. I want you to give me everything you have. Sit on this, this I got from Phil Jackson. When we played at Phil, nobody played more than six minutes. He played hard, maybe eight minutes, but you were coming out and the next rotation knew how many minutes they were going to play. So if you make mistakes, I don't believe in substituting on mistakes. If you make a mistake, play. I don't care. It's just a game. You turn the ball over, so what? Bad shot, so what? Miss the defensive assignment, it's okay. We'll correct it when you come to the bench. We'll talk, but I'm not going to pull you out and embarrass you and scream at you because I don't think that motivates today's young people. As a, as a style of play, I, at the end of my coaching career, I, I, I'm not a big pick and roll guy. I'm actually not a pick guy. I took all picks out of our offense. No pick, no, no pick, no ball picks, no away picks. Everything became dive cuts. So it's all about spacing, dive cuts, ball movement, player movement. And when we were good, we were averaging 120 points a game. It was a lot of fun to watch. The thing about scoring a lot of points and doing the minute rotation the way we do, now you have seven or eight guys averaging double figures. When you have seven or eight in high school, if I had six guys averaging double figures, seven guys, I'm getting five or six guys scholarships to play in college. On the pro level, if I have seven or eight guys in double figures, I'm helping you get jobs around the world. I can call up someone in the Philippines and say, I got a kid averaging 16, 12, and, and 8 on 32 minutes, and he's very efficient. Wow, I love that. Show me his film. So if I can help my guys get placed, then it's a really good thing. And that's what we do. Will we win? Yeah, we'll win more than we lose. Are we great defenders? Yeah, we're good defenders. But quite frankly, I believe if I score one more point than you do, I win. So it's not as important as getting up and down the court and really pushing the ball. All right, Coach Brian. Yeah. Well, I just like to say that uh, Coach David is my kind of coach because this, how this, we have the same philosophy. When I was still coaching, that's what I did also. Anyway, uh, Coach, I'm, I want to dig in uh, a bit. Um, I understand, you know, one of our Philippine players here, uh, Japet. Um, well, locally, we all know during that time you, uh, when we talked earlier that um, he was struggling. You, he didn't really make a name, but when he went to the United States, I mean, what was your first impression about him? Uh, he's very long, very athletic. The first time I saw him on, a, on the court was uh, at a, a Midnight Madness game at Western Kentucky where I played with my son, and he won the dunk contest. Uh, I was... Uh, impressed with how long and athletic he was and how he could shoot the ball pretty good. He was pretty skilled to be so big. I mean, 6'9", 6'10", he was just really a pretty gifted young man. But coach, but still, there was still something lacking with Japet to make it, I mean, to the uh, next level. I know he went to the NBA G League and everything, but what did you see that he was lacking? What did, what, what did he have to work on? Well, I think that there's a, um, there's a, a there's a level of, of, of uh, you know, for lack of a better term, we would call it being a dog. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you're, 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 you're um, the, the game means so much to certain people that you're just will do anything to win. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how tough are you? Are you, are you willing? It's not to say he's not tough. It's not to say, but I don't know if it was the same uh, then. I haven't seen him since he was, you know, at, at Western Kentucky. But I, I think it's hard to transition because the further you get up the ladder of this level of basketball, the more it means something. When I went to the Chicago pre-draft camp, I got two chips teeth because somebody punched me in my mouth going for a ball. Hey, I punch you in the mouth. I got a chance to get your job and make a lot of money. It's mm -hmm. a different world the level you go up. Uh, at, at Kansas, they recruit an All-American every year to take mm -hmm. your place. Mm -hmm. Every year, there's another six, eight guy coming in that's as good as you. So what do you do with that? You either tuck your tail between your legs 
and you quit and you go, well, I didn't get a chance. Or you go, no, I'm going to knock you in your nose the first day and you're going to recognize you better go for somebody else's job because this is my job. And I've worked too hard and you go and you got to fight for it. And that's just the way the world of basketball is. It's very, very competitive. And I think back then, I don't know if, if, if he fully understood that when he was at Western Kentucky because you had to really go take that job because they were bringing in another guy to take your place every year. Yeah. Well, I think I don't know Vince agree with me. Has he toughened up <laughs> compared to those times? I know those times he was really – many called him soft and he didn't want to play inside for his height. He didn't want to go under the post. But right now, I think he's doing a better job. Well, you know, he was – It's hard when you're skilled like that. I mean, he can pick and pop. I mean, it's, it's, I, I'd never seen his father play, but I heard his father was the opposite. His father was yeah. really tough. That's was true. A warrior. And, and I think his father taught him how to be – sometimes we teach our kids skills that we don't possess. So he taught him how to pick and pop and handle the ball a little bit better, and, and maybe that's what he fell in love with. I know, like with my oldest son, DJ, he's a brute underneath. I never played like that. He's 6'10", 280 when he's playing at Western Kentucky in Tulsa. And he's knocking people around and doing things I never did. But he couldn't pick and pop and handle the ball like I could. He wasn't that kind of skilled either. So it really is sometimes styles make it. And, you know, the difficulty you go to the Philippines, as a Filipino-born player at that size, I'm certain everybody said, get your big butt under the basket. You got to go into the basket. Even though he was probably trained most of his life to go play away from it. So... I'm certain it took a while for him to understand that. Well, actually, we have another up-and-coming young guy right now. He's seven foot two. I don't know if you've heard of him, Kai Soto. Where where is he going? Where is he? Well, right now he's with NBL, right, Vince? Um, because um, I don't know. I forgot what where he came from. He, he plays for the Adelaide 36ers in yeah. the NBL, coach. No, yeah. In Australia. What was yeah, that? That's a- And that's a great league because they're they're Australians are tough. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're I think that's what made Lamelo Ball so good. I think that was uh, listen. You can say whatever you want to about Lavar uh, being talking too much or whatever, but I'll tell you what, I'd be honored to play with either of those two guards, Lonzo or, or Lamelo, because they know how to play. They can pass. They're they they hit open shots. They they're good. I mean, they're really good. And I think the smartest thing they did with him was go play with the men because, you know, to be honest, if I would have played against Luca when he was 16 and I was playing in Spain, I would have broke him in half. I would have beat him up every time I saw him. At 17, he would know how to arm bar me and keep him off me. At 18, he probably would be better than me. At 19, he's rookie of the year, which is exactly what happens. As a man, you look at these young kids and you want to, you want to go at them until they figure out how to play with you. And then they get better and better and, But in this country, we reclassify our kids. So they play in the same age group or younger. So they look good. So they can get a higher, more money in drafts higher. But that doesn't mean we're getting them ready for the NBA. <laughs> so you look at rookie of the year, Luca, MVP Giannis, MVP Giannis, MVP Jokic. I mean, it's, there's, no, there's, no, uh, there's no doubt that the European model is, is, is working and it really is taking something that was when, when I grew up, you know, when I grew up or Peter Aguilar in, in the Philippines, we grew up on playgrounds playing against men. And they, if you cost them to lose the game, they might beat you up. They might, they're definitely going to yell at you. And there was a consequence for winning and losing. So you play a, a lot more dog. Whereas today's kids in the, in North America, they, they play six AAU games in a weekend, whether they win or lose, The, you know, Bill Self and, and Coach K are at their last game because we want them because they don't care if they want to lose because he's a high-ranked kid. Man, that was not the way it was when I was a kid. When I was a kid, you had to be good and compete every day or else you were going to be embarrassed to not have a chance to play. You had to work for your keep then. That's what uh, these kids don't know uh, right now. They're lucky. I, I think we're stealing that from them. We're You know, we think the adults are going to hurt them, and it's, it's the opposite. The adults are going to make them better. They're going to work with them. A, a good adult, you know, listen, nobody, I remember I was a smart mouth kid. They, were, they had no problem knocking me around going, hey, you're not talking so much now, are you? Well, 
you learn how to shut your mouth and play because they don't want it. They don't want to hear it from me. And, and, you know, my brother would take me to Notre Dame and I'm playing with guys that go on to play in the NBA and I'm 15 years old, but I learned not to be scared of anybody. When I played against high school guys, I'm like, well, shoot, if I could play against Notre Dame guys, why am I scared of these high school kids? They can't guard me. It gives you a swag. Mm-hmm. Coach, I, I want to dial back a bit um, about, well, you mentioned Clay Thompson and about the NBA. Um, we, you talked about shooting. There's this player now who has yet to play um, and um, teams are allegedly staying away from him because he cannot shoot the ball. I'm talking about Ben Simmons. How would you address that if he were to come to you? Well, I, I don't, I, number one, I don't think it's because he can't shoot. Mm. I think it's, it's they're, they're frustrated with what's going on to me emotionally and mentally right now with, yeah. with you know, is he going to show up? Is he going to compete? Is he going to fold? Is he going to play? And, and I think he's, um, he's a wonderfully gifted young man that needs the right coach to get in his head and work with him. Um, the right guy would make a big difference for him. But it's got to be somebody that's got a lot of grace and patience. And he's got he's to know that they believe in him. Again, kids today, they don't care what you know till, you, till they know that you care. If you, don't, if, you know, if you can't convince him you're on his side, and, and again, he can't go someplace and lose because he's done that. And people are labeling him as somebody that, that can't get you to the big time. So if he goes to another a team, and they don't get out of the first round, they're going to go, ah, it's Ben Simmons. So he needs to go someplace where he has a chance to win or a place where they haven't ever won for a long time, like a Detroit, and, and turn him into a contender. That would make a difference. But he, he, his, his, his confidence is obviously hurt right now. And, you know, he's, he's, he's drawn some lines in the sand that I hope don't hurt him for the rest of his career because, you know, sitting out a long time like this is not good for anybody's career when you're not hurt. True, that's true. Actually, there are a lot of them. Coach, last question before I turn you back over to Vince. I'd like to get your take on LeBron James. Um, you mentioned earlier about the kind of player you want, you you look up to. What's your take on how he's been playing and at this age, he's still playing at the high level? Well, I think, I think, um, I think on the good side of LeBron James, he's the greatest athlete that's ever played the game. There's never been a six foot eight, 260, 70 pound man that can do what he does. Um, and you could say that's, that's a gift from God, but I've seen too many videos of him training mm-hmm. and that 37 years old. That's, that's his work ethic. That's his mindset. He's, he's, he is amazing. Uh, the things he's done with his brand and the community and helping the people in Akron, the kind of husband he appears to be and the father, he definitely is. You've got to give him all the respect in the world. Don't know if I love uh, building super teams for a chance to win a championship. I mean, I think if you're the best player in the league, any team you're on should have a chance to win a championship because you're just that good. And, you know, I mean, if he stays in Cleveland from day one and never goes to Miami or, or back to Cleveland or, or to, to L.A. and he wins two or three championships, He is on the godhead of Cleveland at sports. Jim Brown is a football player. Bob Feller is a baseball player. And LeBron James is the greatest thing that's ever happened to Cleveland. He's still awfully good. He's still one of the best to be there. But I don't know if he's ever going to be adored in one town the way he should be because he's just that good. And I think that that's the only negative I can say of him. What he's doing at 37 is... I mean, he's jumping higher than, than, you know, kids are 18, 19. It's unbelievable. And uh, I mean, it's, I heard an interesting stat the other day. Clay Thompson just missed 960 straight days. Mm-hmm. He came in at the same draft class as Kyrie Irving. And he still has played 100 more games than Kyrie. So look at how much injury and missing that Kyrie's had. Do you look at, uh, at LeBron over the years? I think he's played 75, 80% of his games, maybe more, maybe 85, which is remarkable. He doesn't take a lot of days off. He doesn't do a lot of load management. He, he plays minutes. So, I mean, 
you got to respect, you got to respect what Kevin Durant's doing right now. Mm -hmm. People like, can, I can't believe you're playing 40 minutes. He's like, I want to be out there. This is what I do. I love that. I love that about him that he wants to play. Do you think LeBron is gonna, really going to wait for Bronny to make it to the NBA? I, he would love to. <laughs> But, I, know, I mean, 37 I now. About, I mean, again, I've only seen Bronny play in, in, in 20, 30-second highlight clips. Mm -hmm. I don't know how good he really is. I mean, is he an NBA player? I don't know. I don't, I don't know if he's an NBA player. Uh, if he is, how cool would that be? I mean, to be able to play a year or two with, when your son's in the NBA, that'd be unbelievable. We had uh, we had a player to play in our league named Xavier Moon. Mm -hmm. And his first year he played in our league, he's not playing in the NBA. He played with his uncle, Jamario Moon, mm -hmm. who also played. So, you know, how cool is that to, have, to get to play with your uncle pro basketball? Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. All right, thank you, Coach. Ben, back to you. All right, um, you you played for you played for the Jayhawks uh, around the late seventies until early eight early eighties, Coach. Correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. This was around the same time when Larry Bird was still playing for Indiana State. Yes. Yeah, so my freshman year was Magic's last year and Larry's last year, and then my senior year was Michael's first year. So my era was, I played against Magic as a freshman, they had the one championship, and I played against Michael as a senior, they, the, they won the championship. So that kind of bookends my career at, at Kansas. Were there any, I don't know, coach, were there any scrimmages or practice games between UK and Indiana State at that time? No, no. Uh, uh, but, After my sophomore year, I worked Indiana State's basketball camp. <laughs> And that was the year. <laughs> that was the year after Larry had been rookie of the year. Um, and Boston. He um yeah, so Boston. And I got to play against him for a couple of weeks. And and um, you know, he's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that pretty hard, pretty easy. Uh Because you know I'm 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 the six eight former Mr. Basketball Kansas player. I was fresh fresh meat to him. He liked playing against me because I was a little different than everybody else. And so I you know we went at it a few times. And I'd be lying if I said I got the better of him. He's, he's pretty good. At that point, was he already you know trash talking, talking a lot of smack? You know he's just not very friendly. He's just you know if he, he's to, to his friends. One of his teammates was a guy named Brad Miley. They were buddies. They were best friends. But if he doesn't know you, he's not making an effort to get you to know you. That's just who he. That's just how he's built. From a really small town, you know, lost his dad. The tough, tough thing. And you know, he's just a. He's just a really quiet guy. And and but the people that 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 know him, love him. It's just the people he doesn't know. He's not trying to be your buddy. So when he's going at you, he's gonna hit you. And you know, when I played against him in the NBA, it was like. Why? Why would they put a rookie on me? He was offended. I would even guard him like this. What are you doing putting this guy on me? I'm like, uh, you know, and he's pretty good. Hey, Coach, I read an article. There was an article. I think it was high school basketball where they suspended or reprimanded the coach for beating another team by 88 points. Um, what? What? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I mean, you're supposed to play the game for. The full 40 minutes, um, you know, whether you beat your the opposing team by one point or 88 points. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I think, I think, like I watched a tough game last night in high school. The team won by 48 points. Um, the thing I struggle with is the the team that was winning was still pressing with three minutes to go when they're up by 40. So, so the style of play, if that coach won by 88 points and they're pressing to the very end, he should get reprimanded. He should get suspended because it's not about winning. At that point, it's about humiliating. It's about embarrassing. Listen, if I'm beating somebody bad, I'm going to sit back in a zone and try to slow it down. But at the other side of that, when I was in Florida, as a high school coach, we played against a lot of teams that weren't quite as good as us. And I've got seven guys I'm trying to get in double figures. So there were times 
I would leave my guys in a little bit longer because they hadn't scored their points yet. And it's not fair to them that the other team's not very good. So, you know, yeah, I tried to pull it off as, as quickly as I could, but I got to leave my guys in there playing until everyone, I mean, I'm literally going, okay, how many does Jamison have? How many does Daniel have? How many does do the twins have? I mean, I'm going through each of my players to make certain that they all are scoring double figures. Then I'm then, then okay. Now you go in for him so that I don't hurt my guy. I'm trying to get scholarships for. So there are things like that, but that sounds like a case where somebody's just being a bully. And I don't think you serve your own players very well. If you don't have grace for the other team, that's not, that's not a good life lesson for them. So yeah, we want to put our foot on your neck and we want to win, but I don't want to embarrass anybody. That's not needed. The, you know, you, I know you, you know, the work ethic of, of, of Michael and Kobe, you know, both uh, legends and icons in, in the game, you know, the whether, whether it's a, uh, well, holidays or whether rain or shine they're at the gym um taking hundreds and thousands of jump shots is this a work ethic that you would that you would recommend to your kids um if that's your passion you know i mean if 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 your passion is to be the best that ever played absolutely i mean uh when I, when I was in Canada coaching, I was also a small part of a prep school and we had Jamal Murray and Jamal Murray was a high school kid. He was in, we had a shooting, we had a room that was just like a tiny gym that with a gun in it that you could shoot and get the ball kicked back to you. Jamal was in there every chance he could. He just really, really worked hard and he's got a great NBA career. So you know, if that's what you want, you got to work for it. I, I would argue that um, that no one's going to outwork me in this business. I work seven days a week. I'm on call 24-7. My, my teams know that we're empty nesters. Our four kids and, and seven grandbabies don't live with us. So if you need me on a weekend, you call me, I'm answering the phone. I never, I never shut down because I'm trying to build something that I think will be generational that will go on and impact lives for a long time. So for me, it's just a work ethic that anyone should have when you have a, a major goal like that. But Kobe and Mike, they're, 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 they don't want to lose what they fought for. I mean, a lot of Kobe's work ethic was good from day one, but it sure seems like it picked up as his career went on and he didn't want to end anything but on a very high note. And that's why he did so, so, so such amazing work. All right, Coach. Um, where... How do you, you know, I mean, okay, can you tell us, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, who is your all-time uh, Indiana, Indiana, state of Indiana, you know, basketball starting five? Um, uh, Oscar Robertson, um, Larry Bird, uh, Rick Mount, um, George McGinnis, um, Probably Kent Benson, you know, and the Kent Benson's a undefeated national champion, uh, playing center. Um, Rick Mount is the first player ever to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated as a high school player. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Larry's one of the best players to ever play the game. Um, you know, you, you just you you look at those guys. Oscar Robertson averaged a triple double one year. Um, before it was just taking rebounds from each other and holding the ball to get assist within the flow of the game. And you sit back and go out now. Uh, and, and George McGinnis was just a dominant player. Now, big dog Robinson was awfully good. Glenn, Glenn Robinson. And he would be yes. on that, that next group. And, and, you know, uh, uh, Steve Alford was an amazing high school player. Mm -hmm. Kyle Macy was an amazing high school player. Um, you know, there was, there's, uh, uh, there's a guy named Jimmy rail. That was a great high school player to score a lot of points. Um, you know, I, I would say, uh, that I'm not in any of those groups, uh, cause they're just really good. They're legendary. I was Indiana high school, Mr. Basketball. I don't even know if I was the best player in, in, in Indiana that year. I was the best story. You know, my mother died 
on a Tuesday and we buried her early on a Friday so I could play in that game because I had to go to class for one hour. And so the day we buried my mom, I had 40 points in the first half of the game. That's the kind of thing that makes an Indiana story that they like. But I don't know if I was the best player. I was just a really good story. So those are the things that made me Mr. Basketball. But those, those other guys, they're all legends. And they're, they're great. Ray Tolbert was a great player that went on to play in the NBA and won a national championship. And, you know, there's just a lot of really good, talented guys. Hey, what, the, if you saw the national championship game coach between Duke and Butler, and if you saw that shot by Gordon Hayward that almost went in, were you able to watch that game live? Yeah, not, not, I wasn't at the game, but I watched it live in a restaurant bar in Indianapolis where Butler is. And doggone, if that would have went in, that place would have went crazy. It was unbelievable. And I'm going to tell you, Brad Stevens, if you think he's a good guy, you're underestimating him. He's a great guy. He tried to recruit my son a little bit before he became the head coach at Butler. He was the assistant. And, you know, we talked on the phone a few times, and I remember texting him just to say congratulations in between the Final Four game and the championship game. He must have texted me from the locker room. Well, thanks, Mags. I appreciate it. He doesn't know me. I'm, he had to have a thousand texts for him to take the time to do that. Man, I'm really impressed by him. He's a, he's a really good guy from what I can tell. What are your thoughts on, you know, you have high school players entering um, leagues, getting paid six digits, uh, the overtime league and, and, and other leagues. What are your thoughts on this coach? Oh, I think it's, I think it's good. I think it's, it's, especially if they continue to get their degrees because that's the only way we'll compete with Europe. Now, I think the overtime league should, should play in our league. They should play against men, not play against other high school kids because I think you'll get better playing against men. That's just, that's just a belief I have. Does that mean everybody should skip college? No. But if, if you know, how many kids that have ever gone pro went back and got their degree? They're not there to get a degree. They're there to get showcased so they can get a college, so they can get in the NBA. Well, if that's what their goal is, then, then, then just go on and be a pro right now. I mean, why wait till you're 19? Why don't you do it at 16 or 17? Again, still get your – stay at home, play at your uh, – go to your local high school, get your high school degree, go online. COVID taught us you don't need to be in a building to get a college degree. Just go online and get your college degree, but start working on your craft to be a pro. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Coach, Coach, before I turn you over to Brian, you were an, an academic All-American at, uh, at UK. And during your time, there was no social media, no, no computers to, you know, no internet, no Wi-Fi, none of that. How challenging was it to balance academics and, you know, your, your scholarship to the school? Well, it was, it was uh, you know, it was um, it was not complicated because I got married between my junior and senior year in college. You know, uh, again, my wife is beautiful. And for me, for her to say yes, I had to get her off the market as fast as I could before she'd figure out she could do better than me. So I married her when I was a junior in college. So the year I became academic All-American, I had a lot of motivation. I mean, I wanted to be an NBA player and, and provide for my family, my wife. And, and I didn't want anybody ever saying I was a poor student because if basketball didn't work out, I wanted to get my degree. I was married. So I was a lot more serious than most seniors in college. Uh, so it, was, it wasn't hard at all because I was just going to – again, you talk about that Kobe Michael type drive. There was no way I wasn't getting a 4.0. I wasn't going to be the best player I could be because I had some, a reason to drive, and that was to, to, to honor my wife. And you know, as as you know, you know, student athletes now are 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 getting paid. Coach, um, what are your thoughts on this? Did you, you know, did you when 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 this all happened, did you didn't you wish that uh, I I wish they did this way back? I wish they did yeah. this. Absolutely, only because you know, 
I'm a six eight white guy that can score the ball. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, how much money would I've gotten paid as a as 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 someone that was unique. I was an anomaly. I hadn't seen many guys that that played the way I played. I stood out. I looked different. Yeah, you can. You, yeah, that name, image, likeness would have been something that could have been pretty cool for me. But in the same, you know, it's money. I mean, money's like Doritos. They'll make more. You know, you just keep eating them. They'll make it. I mean, I think too many people worship money. It's 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 a fleeting thing. And we, we all live in that dash between birth and death. What do we do with that time? Because we're not taking it with us. Nobody sees a hearse with an ATM being pulled behind it. When you're done, you're done. So I don't, I don't need money to be happy. I need to, to be with the right people and serve my God and, and be the kind of father and husband I want to be and impact lives. That's wealth to me. I, I tell young people that you define wealth, don't let it define you. And again, my def- definition is my relationship with God, my relationship with my wife and kids and grandkids. And from that perspective, I'm the wealthiest man you all have ever interviewed. I got a beautiful wife. That's my best friend. My kids keep me relevant. My grandkids are, 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 are going to be keep me relevant the rest of my days. And I serve a risen savior. So I know I've got a great relationship with God. So I look at that and I go, you know, how can you be more wealthy than that? Yeah, I can have money. Yeah, I can, I can have a better house or I can fly more instead of drive, but that doesn't define who I am. What defines who I am are those other things. All right, Brian. Well, um, I just want to go back to, uh, Coach, you mentioned something about Derek Rowland. I, we were talking about him earlier. I think he's, yeah. he's coaching, right? Because I, I looked him up. He played here in 1988 um, with, uh, along with uh, another um, import to, uh, who passed away, unfortunately, um, Bobby Ray Parks. Uh, can you tell us something more about uh, uh, Derek? So Derek was my backup for the Patroons. So I started and Derek was my backup. Um, but he played more minutes than I did because Derek was really good. Remember, Phil liked two different lines. And mm-hmm. In that second line, Derek was a really good scorer. I'm more of a shooter. Derek's more of a scorer. And it worked out great for him. Um, and then, you know, he went on to have that good career playing overseas. He played 10, 12 years, 13 mm-hmm. years. And he came back and coached in our league and won a championship with the Albany Patroons. And now he's coaching with Potawatomi, our new team owned by a native American tribe, the Potawatomi citizens, Potawatomi nation in Shawnee, Oklahoma. And he's going to be a tough out. He's going to be a tough coach. He knows what he's doing. He's the old school coach. He's got a real good feel for the game and kids. He really, he can take anybody and and get into their head and work with them. He's, he does a nice job. Coach, correct me if I'm wrong. Did I hear it right earlier? Did he work out with Japet and your son? No. Okay. That was that was Dickie Simpkins. Oh, the, oh, Dickie Simpkins. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, any thoughts on what Dickie Simpkins said about Japet? Just, I mean, he thought Japet was a a uh, uh, just doing drills was one of the more talented guys you could put in front of an NBA scout, mm-hmm. and then when they played he lost a little bit because he didn't always show as well in the game. And my son was probably the opposite. Probably didn't show as well in the drills because he wasn't the same kind of skill, but his toughness was so strong in the game and he banged people around that the scouts would like the way my son played inside. So it was kind of a probably combined. They'd have been one great player. Okay. Coach, for my last question, because I, I see a lot of Jayhawks playing the NBA. Who would you say are the top five for you? Of all time? Yep. For you. Uh, Wilt Chamberlain, JoJo White, Danny Manning. Um, I would say that uh, Paul Pierce. Mm. Um, and, I, and I'd say um, Darnell Valentine. Mm-hmm. Uh, Darnell, because I'm a homer and I play with him and I love him. Um, Wilt, because he's arguably one of the best that ever played the game. I think Danny Manning was one of the best college players that ever played the game and never hurts his knee. He's probably one of the best NBA players and still played 16, 17 years in the NBA with bad wheels. Uh, Pierce, you know, it goes without saying how good he was. And JoJo White was MVP of the NBA Finals one year at the Celtics. He's a Hall of Famer. Yeah, those, those guys are pretty good. But again, then you can come back to 
Rainy Plum France and 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 mm -hmm. um and and uh Pritchard and and um uh Pollard and uh and just so many great players that 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 went on to play in the NBA that you gotta give respect to and, and you know Adonis Jordan was a great player and it's just there's just so many of them that you can't remember them all. All right, thanks coach. Um Vince back to you. All right, coach, um, we have a few minutes left and I, we know you have a camp that uh, you have to head, head out to. Um, my last question is, you know, the, the, the league in the NBA, is it, is it a player's league or, or you know, do, do our coaches, uh, are coaches still relevant or is it a player's league already? Um, I think coaches are very, but not in the way they used to be. So it's much more, how do I um, convince these guys what, what the greater good is? I mean, listen, those guys obviously buy in. When Popovich was making it work, they were buying into what he did. Uh, they, he picked guys that would buy into what he did. Uh, Steve Kerr has guys that believe what he's doing. Um, you know, some of the Monty Williams, my goodness, they almost won it all. The guy that's 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 that's, that's coaching in, in in Milwaukee, he's got those kids. You know, again, you see good coaches, you got to give them their due, because after Giannis, it's hard to remember who else is really great on that team. Yet they're right there competing. You know, right now Billy Donovan is doing a whale of a job in Chicago. I mean, Billy Donovan won back-to-back -back national championships in college, and now he's got one of the best teams in the NBA, and he built that team. So you got to give him a lot of credit. So there's some very good coaches that have impacts. And then how do you sit back and stand out and let LeBron do LeBron? Because you can overcoach LeBron and he's not going to respond. So there's a the right touch to that. And I think, I think that's what, you know, the, the guy's trying to do in LA right now. And it's just not easy. On that note, coach, thank you so much for your time. And uh, it, it was an absolute honor to have you on the show and um, you know stay safe we wish you the best of luck with uh, TVL and and also you know and and mentoring and coaching and and teaching teaching kids well and i and i'd like to tell you that you know how great is it that our wonderful game that started in Springfield Massachusetts with a Canadian minister is so popular around the world and to know what it means to to, to people in the Philippines I wish I spoke to Gallic so I could say thank you in your language because I have mad respect for them. And, and you know, follow us on thebasketballleague.net. Watch our we games do. on tbltv.net and, and, and see some things that you'll like. I think you'll be, you'll be, you'll be impressed. I appreciate you all. Have a blessed day. All right, Coach, before we, before we let you go, a, uh, a picture. Uh, I'll send you a copy for posterity. Okay. All right, on three. One, two, three. There you go. Thanks, guys. Appreciate right, it. Thank coach. you, Coach. Take care. Bye-bye. And that ends another episode of Sports for All. Thank you to Brian Yalung for joining me on, on tonight's program. And uh, everybody stay safe and uh, be nice to each other. Good night. Night.